remember a couple years ago coming and enjoying your fellowship, being able to worship with you, uh, do different door knocking, canvassing, uh, various things, uh, and it was it was a great experience. Um, you know, one of the things that I think about right off the bat when I think about this congregation is just how uh, how uh, giving and how willing you are to, to serve other people. Uh, I actually came three years ago first, and I stayed with the with Andy Chavarri. I've known him for a long time. Two years I came, I stayed with the uh, with the Olson family, and uh, I was so grateful for them. And their oldest boy was actually willing to give me his bed for for the week, and so obviously he made a great sacrifice for me, so I wouldn't have a hurt back the entire week. Now, as was already said for this summer series, y'all are studying the perfect leader. Tonight I've been given the task of talking to you about the compassionate leader. And I was told that the basis of this study is going to be from Hebrews chapter 12. So if you would, turn your Bibles over there for just a brief moment. That's not going to be our base text tonight, but we'll look at it just as an introduction. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are, or, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness... Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which also clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Allow me to ask you a question. Why? Why follow Jesus? What is it about Him that we should follow? Why should we look to Him? Take a moment and think about some of the greatest leaders that mankind has ever known in our history. The greatest we've ever seen. There are going to be some on the good side. There are going to be some on the bad side. You think about maybe political leaders such as Abraham Lincoln, who may be the first one to come off your mind. You think about others like Fidel Castro, who while he may not have done good things, was definitely a great leader in the fact that many people followed him. And even more, you think about a man like Alexander the Great, who conquered so much territory, or even... Adolf Hitler, who we know, if you look back at history, he did terrible, heinous crimes uh, to the world. But regardless of what he actually did, he was a great leader in the fact that he got an entire nation to follow him. Then there are men who are, or men and women who are more of the humanitarian style. You've got Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Gandhi. Maybe you think about sports leaders. The first one that comes to my mind, because I'm a, just a football guru, is uh, not a guru. Let me fix that. I'm not a guru at anything. But since I'm a fan of football, Vince Lombardi is one that comes to my mind. Tom Landry specifically, because I'm a Cowboys fan and my dad talks about him constantly. Maybe you think Jason Garrett's a great leader at the moment, depending on how many wins they get this season. You've got Coach K, uh, other various people uh, that you may come, come to think of. But like I, like I had mentioned a second ago, being a great leader is not based off what you do. It's based off the influence that you have. The outcome is not important. It's the influence that determines whether you are a great leader. Adolf Hitler and Martin Luther King could not have been further apart in their ideology, but they are similar in their influence, that they got millions of people to follow them over the years. Martin Luther King's influence helped to correct much of the segregation and racial issues in our country. Martin Luther King was a great man who did a great thing. Adolf Hitler, on the other hand, was a man who rose from nothing to become a powerful leader or a, become a leader of a powerful country. Through speeches, propaganda, and a radical uh, change in his appearance and his uh, perception, he swayed the minds of the people in that country to follow him to do his bidding. However, like I had mentioned, as we look through history, we know that though he was a great leader, he was a terrible person. He led people to do terrible things. Now consider all the great leaders we had to choose from. Why is it that we should follow Jesus? What is it about him that makes us follow him, that we should look to him? What is it about him that makes him the greatest leader of all time? The greatest leader that mankind has ever known and will ever know. This evening, I've been commissioned to discuss not only the fact that he was a great leader, but his compassionate leadership, various aspects of his leadership. We're going to analyze the compassionate character that Jesus showed during his ministry and discover three results of that kind of leadership. 
So to do so, I'm going to need you to turn over to Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Luke 7, verses 11 through 17 is going to be the base passage tonight, where we'll spend a good amount of our time, probably 90% of our time in that section. Now, as you turn there, the passage gives us a perspective into the ministry of Jesus Christ. It sits in the midsection of a chapter that speaks about his compassionate nature. Right before this section, we see in verses 1 through 10 where he has just healed the centurion's servants. Uh, the, the centurion's servants. Then after verses 11 through 17, after his encounter with John the Baptist, we again see an act of compassion from him where he forgives the woman who was wiping his feet with his tears a woman who had done heinous things, someone that the men sitting there with Jesus did not even want, him, want her in their presence. And Jesus forgave her of her sins. I wish we could spend the time tonight to study entire, the entirety of chapter 7 to where we could see the progression that happens. You see, in this section, at the very beginning with the centurion servant, you see a man who is physically healed of his, of his illnesses. Then you move on a little bit to the section we will study, and you see a man who is raised from the dead, physically speaking. And then as you go on in the passage, you see a woman who is raised from the dead, spiritually speaking. It's an incredible thought to think of that progression and how amazing it was for Christ to be able to do these things. But tonight what we're going to do is we're going to focus on verses 11 through 17. In doing so, I want you to focus on one phrase. This phrase is important. Keep it in your mind throughout the entirety of the lesson tonight. It's this. Compassion like Jesus's brings life to the dead, all to the living, and a call of compassion to his disciples. I'm going to repeat that again because it's vitally important. Compassion like Jesus's brings life to the dead, all to the living, and a call of compassion to his disciples. So to get ready for this section, let's read verses 11 through 17. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave to him his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. first thing we're going to see tonight is that compassion like Jesus brings life to the dead, verses 11 through 15. Compassion like Jesus brings life to the dead. There in verses 11 through 12, we see two crowds meet together. See, compassion like Jesus brings life to the dead, not in the, the first thing in, the, in our passage, verses 11 through 12, these two crowds. But before we look more deeply into that, I want us to understand that spiritually speaking, each one of us is in one of these two crowds that we are about to meet. The two crowds that come together. It says in verse 11 that soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. Nain was about 25 miles southeast of Capernaum and only about six, and a half, or six miles away from, uh, from uh, Nazareth where Jesus grew up. To give you a frame of reference, now, it worked out perfectly at Southwest because Southwest is almost exactly 25 miles away from my home in San Marcos. Here, I had to kind of figure it out. All right, Hubbard, I believe that's how you say it, Hubbard, not Hubbard or anything like that, Hubbard. Hubbard, as I was driving in, looked like it was about 26 miles based off my map that I saw on the street sign. And so imagine a distance from, from here where we are in Corsicana walking to Hubbard. Now, looking at the life that Jesus lived, it's very clear that he probably did not um, ride in a boat or have any kind of a vehicle that he rode in. Maybe he, he might at various times would have ridden on a donkey if somebody had loaned him that donkey. But more than anything, he would have walked that entire distance, 26 miles. I don't know about you, but I would have been exhausted at the end of 26 miles. I can barely get through a day of 3,000 steps without feeling exhausted at the end, much less 26 miles. 
And I assure you that he and his disciples and all those, else, those other people who followed him were exhausted when they got to the city. And it was there just as they were about to enter the gate that they noticed this crowd of people. In verse 12 it says, A man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, mother and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Verse 12. This was a first century funeral procession. Maybe you've seen one recently or seen one just in your lifetime. It seems as though they are much more common in smaller towns uh, than larger towns. And in fact, it seems that today, respect for families who have lost a loved one is waning. We look at a family who, who loses their mother, maybe the patriarch of the family, and it's so easy for us to just kind of turn around and go the other way and forget that it ever happened. We might give a condolence and say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that it's painful. But when we really think about the emotions that we're feeling for them, it's, it's almost empty. And in fact, when we look at the response to people during funeral processions today, it's no doubt that that's the case. You see, at that time, it would have been a near capital offense to not stop, or, or actually, I think about my own lifetime, growing up in small towns like Buda, Texas, I'm sure none of y'all have ever heard of that place, Comanche, Texas, uh, Port Lavaca, Texas, little bitty towns, maybe 4,000 on a good day if there is a, a spurt of growth over the weekend. But in these towns, you would be driving down the road and you would see two cop cars, maybe one if it was a smaller town that could only afford two or three cop cars. And when you saw that cop car coming, and there was a line of people behind it, it was a terrible thing if you didn't stop and pull over the side of the road and remove your hat and sit there, maybe say a little prayer, whatever it was you do, maybe just sat there in silence. But today, so many times, even in my own family's funerals where I've, seen, where I've been in that procession, I see people just zipping by like nothing's going on. Complete disregard for what's going, what the pain that's being felt for those who are in that situation. This is what was going on for these people that Jesus saw. To disrespect a family who, is just, or to, who has just lost a loved one is the lowest of disrespect. Now, at the time that Jesus walked the earth, the death of a loved one was still treated with respect, much more so than today. When preparations for burial were completed, the body of the deceased was usually placed in the coffin. And it was taken outside to the, burial, to the burial site, usually carried by pallbearers that we would call them today, just bearers. They would take them to the burial site, and it would be followed by relatives, friends, servants, anyone who had any connection whatsoever with the deceased, whether it be family, friend, or acquaintance. The procession carried out mourning, a deep mourning ritual. Men would cut their beards. People would shave their heads, men and women, as a sign of extreme grief. They would tear their clothes apart. They would throw ashes on themselves. They would sit in ashes, do whatever they could possibly do to express the pain they were going through. Just simply crying wasn't enough. They did whatever they could to express their pain. I can almost hear the screaming cries of the people in that procession as Jesus walked up. Especially the mother. See, these two people were going, or these two groups were going in opposite directions. One was going in a funeral procession, going to their grave. Now, when death comes, it is the end. There is no going back after death. Death is a physical separation of the spirit or the life force from the body. It is a rending of the physical from the spiritual. Our, body, or our spirit returns to the Father who gave it, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Our life force returns to Him. Our physical body returns to the dust from whence it came, Genesis 3, verse 19. And in like manner, our spiritual death is a separation of our soul from God, of us from God. Isaiah 59, verse 1, 2 tells us that, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear dull that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he does not hear. 
John confirmed this in his gospel account, saying, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. John 3 and verse 36. Now on the other hand, Jesus and his disciples were entering into the city. Now while the city of Nain was rarely ever spoken of, and in fact, as far as I know, this is the only time that Nain is ever spoken of. There may be other references of it in a, in a different name or of a different type of its name. But as unspectacular as it was, as it surely would have been, what was more important was their communion with Christ. The disciples who were going with him. The people who were with him who had witnessed his miracles beforehand. They were going to be in the city, resting, in communion with Christ. Physically speaking. Now spiritually speaking, Jesus and his disciples going into the city. But not a city built with brick and stone of wood. A city that, as beautiful as this building is, as we look at, pales in comparison to the city that they are going into. You think of the greatest cities that we know, the New Yorks of the world, the Parises of the world, whatever other city you can possibly think of that's gorgeous, they pale in comparison to the city where they were going. See, their city was not going to be corrupted by rust or moths. But it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse city, they were going to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. And then in verse 16, it says, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. These two people, these two groups were going into entirely different settings. One was going to the city, going to the grave. The other was, after a long journey, was going into the city. Spiritually speaking, each one of us is in one of these two cities, is in one of these two groups, either going into the city or going to the grave. And after these two groups met, after we see them interact with each other, we see the two sufferers meet. In verses 12 and 13. It is at the close of verse 12 and verse 13 where we see the two sufferers. The dead man who was being carried out was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. The woman was now completely alone and seemingly unprotected. She had no close relative, no husband, no sons, no one to protect her, no one to provide for her. As the crowd worked its way towards the gravesite, and as Jesus looked upon her with the tear-crusted ashes that lined her cheeks, it is not hard to imagine the pain that must have filled her eyes, a pain that comes only from death and sorrow. I've seen a childless mother. I have seen a husbandless wife. And sadly, there is no earthly thing that we can do to make them feel better. Once your son is gone, your son is gone. Once your husband is gone, your husband is gone. I can't help but, went through what, I can't help but wonder what went through Jesus' mind as he encountered this widow. Did he think of his own mother? Did Jesus have the ability to see into the future like it was a movie strip? To be able to see the pain that his mother suffered while he was hanging battered and crushed and bruised on the cross? Is that what entered into his mind as he saw this woman, this widow? Or did his thoughts go to his heavenly Father, 
who not only gave up his only son, but gave up his only son to die a terrible death because of our sins, because of your sins. We often fall victim to the thought that Jesus was the only one who sacrificed anything on that day. But our Father in heaven, in essence, had his Son taken away from him because of our sins. Just like this mother's son was taken away from her. Could he just have decided to damn the world and to save himself and to just completely reject us to save his son? Yes. You bet. He had the right to do that. It was completely within his power to say, you messed up, you're done, I'm sorry, our relationship is severed forever. Just like a marriage relationship where somebody cheats. It is the innocent party's prerogative to separate. But... Because of his immeasurable love for us, he allowed his son to come to this world and to die because of our sins. You see, Luke provided this description of the widow who lost her son, not only to show the emotional loss that the woman had, but also to show the desperate, or the desperate financial straits that she was in. With neither a husband nor a son to care for, she would have had no means of support. This woman was alone, hopeless, and in economic distress. Put your own mother in that situation. Imagine your own mother at the end of her life, when she is no longer able to work. After living a life where her sole job was to provide for you, to protect you. And as she sits there, not able to work, no money because it all went to you, to make you better, to provide you what you needed to do. She sits there hopeless. How distraught would you be in that situation? That's where this woman was at. And it was upon seeing her that Jesus had compassion on her. The key word for tonight, compassion. I want to camp out on that word for just a moment to really dig deep and understand what compassion is. Now, don't tell Rick or Sam or anybody at Southwest, but I'm about to use dictionary.com as a definition. I almost used Wikipedia, but I thought better of that. Dictionary.com defines compassion as a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. All in all, that's an okay definition. It's good enough. Well, no, I take that back. It's not good enough. It's good enough for general language, but not for our understanding of the actions of Jesus. If you really want to know what happened to Jesus here, you've got to look a little bit deeper. Compassion comes from a Greek word of which I cannot pronounce under pressure. It is a complicated word, so come to me later and maybe I'll tell it to you. But the Greek word there, it's a fun word. Now, what it means, actually before we get into that, before we go into what it means... Let's do a little bit of a review. We know to some extent that the emotions are located in the entrails of our body, right? This is a concept that through history we understand this. Here's a little test. How many of you remember your first kiss? None of y'all do. Y'all don't remember that. But the rest of y'all who are married, how many of you remember your first kiss? You remember that feeling right before you kissed? Kind of fluttery butterflies in your stomach? Now, 
Think about the most tragic news that you've ever heard. Maybe it was a death in the family. Maybe you lost your job or you heard of somebody who lost your job. Maybe it was somebody who you love and you heard about some decisions they made that were just terrible. Do you remember that feeling that you got where your heart just dropped into your stomach? Your heart sank. It was right there in your stomach. Have you ever cried or laughed so hard and for so long that your stomach was cramping, that you were begging the person who was making you laugh to stop? Seriously, stop, you're hurting me. You see, emotion is in our stomach. It is in our entrails. This is an understanding that they had at this time. The word translated compassion in this verse, it means a physical emotion. A true compassion in the face of misery. It is literally a movement of the entrails at the sight of somebody else's pain. You see the pain that they're going through, and you feel it in your gut. You feel the pain that they're feeling. But, the word here is in a passive mood. That means it's happening to the individual. Not something the individual is doing to somebody else, but it is happening to the individual. So what it means, literally, is that Jesus here did not just take pity. He did not see the, 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 the suffering the woman was going through and did not take pity on her, but he was taken by pity. He had no control over it. It happened to him. Literally, he was taken by a visceral or instinctive feeling of compassion. In modern language today, we may phrase it as he had a feeling in his gut, or in his heart, deep sympathy for the other person. You could say he was deeply moved. One of my least favorite names that Christ has is the man of sorrows. I dislike it. Because I'm the reason why he is a man of sorrows. Just like you and any other person who has ever sinned. Whether it be one or a million sins. And it's interesting that the man of sorrow met the woman of sorrow. And he was deeply moved. And this, the fact that he was deeply moved with compassion, is the very essence of his compassion. He knew what it was to be human, being uniquely qualified to know pain and to comfort pain. Jesus said to the widow, do not weep. Why? Why would he say that? Because he was about to do something incredible. He was about to do something unimaginable. And this is where we see the two sons meet in verses 14 through 15. One son being destined for life, while the other son was destined for death. Jesus approached the coffin, and he touched it. That act alone was astounding. You see, because it was unlawful for, not only for you to have a body in the town, but for anybody to be anywhere near that body, or to touch that body. Jesus defied that law by touching this individual, Now, you'll see in a little bit that he was not going to be unclean in a few moments. But the coffin bearers, the casket bearers, and they saw this, they stopped dead in their tracks. And they heard the Lord said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The Lord spoke to him as if he were only resting. The word here, translated into arise, literally means to wake up. I wish I could have been there when Jesus said that. To see the reactions on, the, on not only the disciples around him, their faces, but on all the people who had witnessed his miracles beforehand. On the coffin bearers, the people who maybe had not even seen Jesus. And depending on who the person was, maybe had not even heard of the things he had done. But put yourself in that situation. A man comes up with a group of people. To some disciples... Some just looking for a handout. He comes up to this group of people, to this processional, 
He stops, he touches the casket, which one was breaking the law like we've already mentioned. And he says, wake up. Wake up. As simple as that. With only two words, just a casual command, no fireworks, no Benny Hinn jacket swing, just two words. As simple as that, the young man rose up. But what happened when he rose up was not just a residual twitch of the finger from undead nerves. It was not a, some other uh, false sense of, of security. But this man, this son, stood up and began to talk to his mother. The impossible had just happened. The reason why he could say, do not weep, is because he could raise her son from the dead. But as easy as it seemed to be, I can almost hear him asking the familiar question. What is easier? For a man to raise another man from the dead or to forgive sin? What do you think the people would have said? To forgive sin. It's impossible to raise people from the dead. You can't do that. But he did it. But what we know is that to forgive sins is so much more difficult than to raise somebody from the dead. So much more costly. I've heard it said that Adam, or that, excuse me, that Eve's decision to eat of the forbidden fruit did not only cost them their purity, it not only cost them their residency in the Garden of Eden, it not only cost them their access to any fruit they could possibly want without having to do much work at all for it, her decision to take of the forbidden fruit cost the second figure of the Godhead his life. And since that ominous day in Genesis 3, Jesus' fate was sealed. But not sealed in the, in the way that we think of. The decision was not one that he could not reject. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free. He had the power to do that, but he didn't. He chose to come into this world to be born of a woman, to be the son of a Jewish carpenter, to live a life perfect and holy, to pay a terrible price for our sins. His death brought us back from the dead. When you see compassion, whether it be compassion that you've read in the pages of the Scripture that you hold in your hand, hopefully at this very moment, or if it be compassion that you see another individual around you doing, don't fix your eyes on the momentary affliction and response. When you see compassion, be reminded of the eternal price and the eternal reward that comes with it. Compassion like Jesus's brings life to the dead. Compassion like Jesus also brings awe to the living. The dead are not the only ones who are affected by the compassion of Christ in this passage. Compassion brings all to the living. It says in verse 16, For, see, for fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. The acts witnessed by the bystanders struck fear into their heart, but not fear in the terrorized sense. Not fear in a scary movie sense. The fear is more akin to reverence than fright. I don't consider myself to be a big man, a large man or anything, larger than I was in high school, but I don't believe myself to be a big man. There are very few instances where I come across another man, however, who does tower over me. 
that puts immediate fear into my heart just because of his size. There's a couple, Shaquille O'Neal, obviously. But there are other individuals, when I see them, I don't, I'm not afraid just because of their presence. But on occasion, I come across a man who has the ability to twist me like a twig. And as I sit there at his feet, there's an uneasiness that swarms over my body, knowing what he can do, regardless of if he's going to do it or not, or has any intention whatsoever to do it. But just being there in his presence makes me a little uneasy. Not out of fear, but out of recognition for the potential that the man has, that he holds. You see, when I'm in the presence of that man who towers over me, I speak a little bit differently. I don't speak to him the same way that I speak to a small man. I don't speak to him who has the power to break me in half the same way that I speak to somebody else who maybe I have the power to break in half. I look at him, I speak to him, and I maintain a level of reverence towards him while I'm in his presence. Now imagine that the man before you was not a physical behemoth. That the man before you was not one who towered over you in size and weight and strength, even in political power or financial power. He's just another man. But that man has the power of God. He has the power of God at his fingertips. The fear that seized these people was one of reverence. Looking to Jesus and understanding the power that was in him was the same power that created life. And that same power that can take life... Man, bells are not my friends. But that man standing before them who had the power to give life to this young man... It's the same one who had power to take life. The same man right there who had the power to create the universe is the one who had the power to destroy the universe. The awe in them was one that was created because of the presence of an incomprehensible nature of his power. Because of the mighty work of Jesus, it aroused fear. But what I want you to notice is where the glory went. The glory went to God. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. We won't spend a lot of time here because I have less than five minutes now. But in Matthew chapter 5, it says, or actually, yeah, in chapter 5, verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. That is not a command. That is an indicative statement. You are the light of the world. There's nothing you can do about it. People look to you and they look to you as guidance. Regardless of your actions, you are the light of the world. The command comes in verse 16. It says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. The miracles performed by Jesus had a twofold purpose. The first one was to give glory to the Father. He did not raise the dead, heal the sick, or feed the hungry to garner attention for himself. He did it to give glory to God. He did not do it to make his recipients feel better. He did not do it to make himself feel better. He did it for the glory of God. Brethren, when you have compassion on somebody, have compassion for the glory of God. Not to make yourself feel better or to make them feel better. We have a misunderstanding of ministry. Not ministry in the role of Sam or Corey, but in ministry that each and every one of us are required to do. To minister to those around us. Ministering is not giving people what they want. Ministering is giving people what God wants. Now, before I get on too much of a soapbox in my last couple minutes, let us consider another phrase in this passage. It says, The bystanders recognized the power of Jesus, and they said, A great prophet has risen among us. 
Luke understands his title is, an, is not an inadequate confession, but is a recognition of what has happened. They understand that what has just happened is similar to 1 Kings 17, where Elijah raised a man from the dead. The same thing. Indeed, a great prophet was among them. But then they say, God has visited his people. What a beautiful statement. God has visited his people. That's how the contemporaries understood it. Lodonata defines uh, this visited as being present with the implication of concern. Being there and concerned about what's going on. In fact, the, English, or the, the Greek word there is where we get our English word, Episcopal. Episcopal churches are churches that are governed by bishops. A bishop can be compared to a shepherd. He knows what's going on in his congregation. He knows when people are hurting. He knows when they are in pain. He can see it. He is there. And Christ, incidentally, is given the title as by the author, or by the Hebrew author, as the, the bishop of our souls. The one who looks after us. He has been raised to the right hand of God where he serves as our high priest, but in a priestly manner, Jesus is still watching over us just as he was there with those people. Compassion like Jesus brings life to the dead, all to the living, and finally, a call of compassion to his disciples. It says in verse 17, And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This reminds me of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. These people, whether they are disciples of Christ or not, they obey the Great Commission. Brethren, we are in a world that is swiftly changing. People who do not deserve recognition inside the building are making headlines because of terrible life choices. And while we may be tempted to go around the system and to devise crazy schemes, ingenious schemes to cut out what has been going on in our country, I'm going to tell you that the answer is simple. If we want to change the world, if we want to change our country, to get it back going in the right direction, there's one answer. Preach the Word. Tell others about Jesus Christ. Tell Him what He gave for you. Tell Him the reward that we have because of Him. Compassion like Jesus brings life to the dead, all to the living, and a call of compassion to His disciples. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and I hope that you will live a life as a compassionate leader, just like Jesus did.